Hello and welcome to our first installment of Test Automation for the Practical Programmer, where our topic will cover connecting to your test instrument using sockets and the Python programming language. If you want to skip directly to the programming parts near the end, that's fine. However, this video will start off by highlighting some of the reasons you may want to choose LAN over other forms of communication and follow that up with some reasons for selecting Python as your programming language of choice. We will then show you how to establish a sockets-based link to your instrument and how to dispose of that. We will then wrap the video up by showing you how to send commands to your instrument and get information back from them. While we all want to use what might be considered the best of the best, far too often price will play a key role in your final decision on selection with respect to practically any purchase that you make, and your instrument communications options are no exception. The use of general purpose instrument bus or GPIB tools has been relied upon by the test and measurement industry for decades and has a few IEEE standards to support it to ensure that users can expect the same behaviors regardless of the controllers or the instruments that adopt the technology. This means that you can almost guarantee it will work without much effort or hassle on your part. With this assurance also comes a price, which is quite evident when you purchase a GPIB controller and cables. With controllers that are generally over 500 US dollars and ranging up to well over 1000 US dollars. The cables can be $50 or more and that all depends on the length you choose. Of all the options, RS-232 or Serial has been around for the longest. Most modern PCs and all laptops have done away with including the RS-232 as part of their standard hardware. hardware. So you will likely need to purchase a USB to Serial adapter. No worries on this because they are generally super cheap and found through numerous electronics distributors. Costs can grow in proportion to the length of the cable that you opt for. I'm listing both USB and LAN at about the same cost level because in most cases, this is attributed, attributed, say that three times fast, to nothing more than the cable length that you select. If you look at your PC or laptop, you'll likely find that both ports are standard. Further, both USB and LAN are becoming the standard communications ports on test instrumentation, whereas GPIB is likely a paid for option. Disclaimer. Not all your applications will require super transmission speed. When they do, it's good to know your options. The least impressive is RS-232 with a mere 28 kilobytes per second, which is only something you can achieve when the baud rate is set to 115K. Don't let this seemingly low number fool you, though. With some quick testing, you may find that your instrument is the bottleneck for speed and that this serial option will more than meet your needs. GPIB started off with data transmission rates of less than two megabytes per second, but newer technology has allowed it to reach as high as 54 megabytes per second. While impressive, this number has stagnated a bit over the last decade. These final two options are continually being enhanced and their data transmission rates are ramping up. While gigabit ethernet and USB 3.0 are becoming more available on modern test instrumentation, these numbers do not do justice to the rates that are available with the very latest, latest versions of these technologies. In the video description, we've provided a link to a site where you can see their potential as instrument manufacturers adopt them to meet their capabilities or to match the capabilities of computers. As your test setups grow, how far the communications can reach will become a factor. For all its newness and speed potential, USB offers the shortest reach with a maximum of 5 meters, and this is using USB 2.0. Moving up to USB 3.0 will limit you to just 3 meters. At a maximum allowable cable length of 15 meters, GPIB and RS-232 come in at a tie. The great thing about LAN is that its reach is not limited by cables. Your PC can access a number of instruments at various distances through switches and Wi-Fi. As for using Python, a strong argument is that it is easy to learn in comparison to other programming languages. We won't struggle with the details here, but we do encourage you to research for yourself. There are plenty of forums and testimonials to support this claim. If you need help, there's plenty out there. 
Python.org is a treasure trove alone, and the forums are great for backup. Additionally, whether you're working on a Windows, Linux, or a Mac PC, Python is supported on all three. For simple applications, you can move your script to each different operating system and have it work. I've done this a couple times, and I find the flexibility very satisfying. Finally, there are several development environments to choose from. Idle comes as part of the Python installation, so you can get started coding right away and save yourself the time of searching. Two other options I use are PyCharm and Visual Studio Code. There's a free community version of PyCharm that supports students and hobbyists. Visual Studio Code is free for now with a few restrictions and has numerous options for adding extensions to customize your experience. Both PyCharm and Visual Studio Code have linting options to help you ensure your Python code meets syntax and style expectations. As this slide says, let's go to the code and see it in action. I'm working in VS Code and will need to add a script file to write my Python code in. Let's simply call this script connect disconnect.py. The first thing I'll need to do is import the sockets package to access the primary tools I'll need for communication. I'm going to define a variable here to hold the communications timeout value that will be used with the different transactions. If the communications operation does not complete in the amount of time, an exception will be thrown. This next statement that I'll add here is the instantiation of a socket object to this inst variable. This first argument that is passed configures the object for use with IP version 4 type connections. The second argument, SockStream, is telling the socket object to use the TCP protocol. The next statement I'm adding here is totally optional, but I want to share it with you for the sake of awareness. In short, we're indicating that we want to disable Nagel's algorithm for this TCP connection. The algorithm is helpful for when dealing with web pages, but it's not as useful here and I've found instances when communicating with instruments where it's proven problematic. This next line is where we'll leverage that timeout value that we defined earlier, ensuring that our socket object adheres to the limit. To make the connection to our instrument, we'll need to provide our sockets object with two things, the instrument IP address and the port to use. At this point, I'll define variables to hold them both. Here's where the magic starts to happen, where we call the method to connect to our instrument. Pay particular attention to how I'm passing the arguments to the connect method. I'm using a tuple with the IP address as the first index item and the port as the second index item. To wrap up and covering the general theme of this video, I'll now show the means for breaking the sockets connection that we just made. This is done quite easily by calling the close method. Even though I've given you all you need, to establish a connection to your instrument through a LAN interface and then disconnecting, I will feel better in proving to you that it works by sending a command to the connected instrument and getting some information back from it. Let's start by using the socket object's send method, passing in the very common ID query command terminated with a carriage return. To ensure the ASCII characters end up formatted such the instrument can understand them, we'll want to leverage the encode method. With no arguments passed, the data will be encoded in UTF-8 format by default. Almost immediately after receipt of the command, our instrument will be ready with a response in its output queue. Let's first define a constant that will indicate the approximate length of data that we expect to receive. As a rule of thumb, it's best to overestimate or we risk losing part of our data. To extract this response, we'll need to use the receive method. Let's define a variable to hold the string response from our instrument, then use the receive method to pull the data off the instrument and over onto our controlling PC. Note that we'll also need to use the decode Python method to ensure the incoming data is formatted as expected, again ideally being in the UTF format. This last call to the rstrip method is just to ensure that we're removing the carriage return that is part of the return string. To verify the response from our instrument, Let's echo the receive data variable to the user with the print method. Let's run our code and make a few observations. We run to our call to connect, then step over the breakpoint to have the instrument object instantiated. 
hovering over the object variable, will provide us some insight and confidence that the socket's connection was made to our end device. We then step over the call to send to issue the command to our instrument. We then step to the call to receive the response from the instrument. Note how we can hover above the variable in the editor for a preview of the response or check the VS Code's variable watch pane for the same. Stepping over the print statement will allow for the instrument ID response to be revealed in the terminal window. In conclusion, we step over our close method, which will terminate the socket's connection to our instrument as well as ending the script operation. That wraps up all I wanted to cover in this presentation. Tune in for the next installment where I'll cover how you might want to clean up your socket's communication operations. Thanks for watching.